So I, I'm going to introduce uh, Jim Laurie. Um, I've known I've known Jim for about 10 years, and it would not be an exaggeration to say that if it weren't for Jim, we wouldn't be here today. Because uh, Jim, he's a restoration ecologist and biologist, and he's had a wide variety of experiences. But in this era of reductionist science, where people break out little pieces of the universe and study it detached from all the other pieces of the universe, and of course, studying the whole universe as a whole is challenging. But Jim is a, a rare scientist who actually has to look at holes. He can't even help himself if he wanted to. I don't think he wants to. And he is um, going to share his, his treasure of knowledge with us today. Is that coming up? Okay, is that, and then how do I make it big? Uh, I'll do it. Okay. See, he'll share it once technology stops saving us. Apple, Apple computer. Apple. <laughs> uh, it's more biodiverse. There we go, okay. And then I just yeah. can do the arrows. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, um, I'm going to ask you, I, I, I have a degree in uh, biology a long time ago and I worked in the chemical industry for a while, but my second degree is in something called future studies. And that helped me think a little bit bigger. And um, so I'm going to ask you to start out by just looking at this slide and say, can you imagine a New England savanna? And it's, in other words, it's not all about trees and it's not all about grazing. It's not all about wetlands, but all of those things. And we should include the ocean, because probably, I don't know, two-thirds of our protein once came from the Gulf of Maine. And uh, yeah, so, so I'm going to try to cover all that and uh, hope nobody stops me. So um, biodiversity, the, the bio for climate people, uh, they've been amazing to me. They've been like friends of mine that have gone out and tried to figure this stuff out. But now I just put up the consequences. What are the consequences of losing biodiversity? And um, the heartbreaking one is number five, of course, because we miss a lot of things that we used to have. And we don't even know we miss them. So I was going to take you on a little adventure. The other stuff we can talk about, and they, they're kind of human related. But I kind of want to talk a little bit about uh, what are the other species that are going to do 90% of the work if we're going to return to a somewhat stable climate. And uh, so this is, this is a picture I drew, oh, about six, seven years ago. And in, in the 1990s, we thought dung beetles, you know, working down in Texas with uh, the Allen Savory ranchers, we thought dung beetles were really important. And that was a piece that was missing. But then more recently, I've learned about fungi. And it turns out uh, that's a huge piece too that most of our soils don't have fungi uh, working to help the plants like they used to. And uh, so I just say, there they are, and over here. So, um, so I made this outrageous statement six, seven years ago. I said, make soil end global warming. Um, I, I, it was kind of a dare to say, Who's, who, who, where am I wrong here? And it's actually kind of stood on its own pretty well. So let's go back. I like to study case studies of people doing really neat stuff where the land is actually getting better. And I like to go back and try to figure out what was going on on Earth, you know, earlier. And you hear about the sixth extinction. We've had five major extinctions, and now we're talking about a sixth one that we have some part in. And um, so what was North America like, say, you know, 20,000 years ago. And you can see there's mastodons there, there's lions in North America. Um, and all these animals went extinct. And uh, I, I think that statement at the bottom, Scientific American, uh, David Biello saying, uh, we, we have a poop paucity predicament. That big animals are like nutrient arteries of the planet, and if they go extinct, it's like severing those arteries. 
we need the animals on the land. And that's uh, probably as good a way as I've, I've, I've ever seen it said. But then you start looking around and you say, well, uh, there's a picture of uh, John James Audubon and he's, he's talking about uh, 200 years ago, he watched three days of passenger pigeons go over his head and he estimated there were three or four billion birds. You know, in some places like Wisconsin, it'd be two inches of soil would be deposited. Nutrients coming from the south in the spring and going back south in the fall. We used to have those kind of, you know, every so often they'd have herds like this show up in New England. And we also had salmon at one time. Of course, the West Coast has lost a lot of their salmon. We've lost almost all of our salmon. So there's another nutrient pump. Um, so um, Jeffrey Bolster up at University of New Hampshire tried to figure out what is the history of New England in terms of the sea. And uh, he actually took the history from 1520 to 1920 because he thought our culture right now thinks that we've lost our ocean resources over the last hundred years. And he says, no, no, no. It was much, 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 much bigger than that, you know, before 1920. And that's, that's the part he wanted to, to discuss. And um, it, look at that. It says, in 1600, a coastal savanna ran from what is now Portland, Maine, to eastern Connecticut, prairie grasses and wetlands, the heath end, he says, well, that's now extinct. But the Indians actually had a prairie along the coast and it had chestnuts and elms and hickories and all these huge trees. And of course, chestnuts are very productive. So um, the streams flowed all year long. How many people live near streams that don't flow all year long? And of course, that's a wetland issue too. Um, and I just remember one, I'll just say one comment. Menhaden used to bring uh, mackerel and all kinds of fish north from Chesapeake Bay area every year and the, the, the schools of Menhaden were square miles in size, tens of square miles in size, and going past Gloucester. And imagine all the fish that they would bring with them because they're a forage fish, they eat algae. Right now we say we have dead zones. Um, well, nobody's eating the algae. We don't have the, the fish with the gill s structures that can take that away. Why is that? Well, Menhaden have to go south in the winter because that's where the algae is. And if they get fished out at Chesapeake Bay, which they have been for years, there's not enough of them to really come back. They've got plenty to eat down there. They used to be able to clean out Chesapeake Bay, for instance, in days. And they'd start moving north and they'd bring everybody with them. All the fish we really wanted depended on these fish. And then the, the, the idea of getting alewives and river herring to go up the rivers, well, that would feed salmon. It would feed the fish that used to go up the rivers. And uh, the one I see here is uh, sturgeon. I was reading last night. They're talking about 20-foot sturgeon in like the Merrimack going upstream. So, you know. Um, and so the, the bottom quote on this page in May, 19, in May 1664, the, f the farmers were complaining because somebody was gonna dam the river. And we now are just starting to talk about undamming the rivers and allowing the fish to come upstream. And I think the Department of Natural Resources says 38, 38 dams have been broken. There's only 3,300 in the state. They're talking about 1,000. Help, help them out with that idea. And uh, so, okay, so that's some ideas about what's been lost. Uh, let's go here. Uh, Great Plains. I was trained in a lot of this stuff in Texas. And uh, imagine if you're in a buffalo herd, there's 100,000 animals in the buffalo herd, and you've been in this area for about 18 hours, and what does it smell like? The buffalo herd now is kind of doing quorum sensing and they're trying to figure out where's the sweetest grass. And it might be 20 miles away, but as they move towards it, if, if, if somebody can smell the sweet grass, they'll start moving and then the herd will start figuring it out. And over time, they'll start moving in that direction. They won't come back to this stinky place that they've been in for 18 hours until it recovers. 
So that was how it used to be, I think. Uh, this is the same area now in West Texas. This is cotton. These are as, these are as big as uh, school buses. Well, maybe Greyhound buses. Now, how much dark matter do you see in that soil? How much soil is being covered up from the Texas sun? Um, Texas is really losing its, its ground. You know, I was a medic in the Army, and uh, when somebody was laying on the ground bleeding or unconscious, we were told to do something. And we see land like this all the time, and we don't declare an emergency. Uh, anybody got any idea what that is? It's a dry river bed. It's the Red River. It drains most of the Panhandle area, and it's um, November. It's not the dead of summer. So we have a soil extinction going on. The megafauna extinction was part of that because we, we have a poop paucity uh, predicament. When we put up barbed wire, the herds couldn't move to the sweet grass. Then the plow came in, and that's when the Dust Bowl started. And uh, now, we're, now we're doing chemical warfare. So now the fungi can't live on the soil. And uh, we're inhibiting photosynthesis, we're inhibiting pho uh, humification. That's my estimate. Okay, what do we do? I'm gonna talk real quickly about three examples of people that were desperate that went, well, the first two were desperate and they didn't have any money and they had said, how do we make a living on the land? You know, and the first one's the Maddoxes and I learned a lot from them. And that's actually the document they showed me in, in uh, 1994. 1990, oh, June, June 12th, 1993. And um, they had 22,000 acres. They'd cut their herds back and back and back. They'd used, uh, they were fighting mesquite. They thought mesquite was the problem. And then they went to a savory course. And they did their financial planning and they found out we can't afford chemicals. So that saved them $200,000 a year. And then they uh, got rid of like three quarters of their vehicles and they started trying to run the animals in herds like Savory recommended, but they didn't have enough animals. And pretty soon people came, come, came to them and said, can we let our animals run on your land because we don't have any grass where we are. And they kind of shifted their thinking and says, well, if we have a grazing plan, we can bring this area back. And uh, by, the, by 1993, this is seven years later, they were out of debt. Now the part I didn't tell you about is, and this is something to think about, they suddenly had all the wildlife in the neighborhood. They had all the water. The water cycle was the first thing that changed. And so they put ads in the Houston paper saying, uh, hunters, come out to our place and you'll have a deer lease on our land. And uh, we got a lot of wildlife here and the hunters really like to do that. But now if you're grazing in a grazing plan and you've got your, your cattle over here, you don't put the hunters over where your cattle are, you put them over here. Where do you think the wildlife goes? They're gonna be over there. They never lost much wildlife. So that became a big cash flow for them. Um, I say that, what can we do in New England that's similar? Uh, dung beetles, tons and tons of manure going under. If the dung beetles came back, Joe Maddox, when he first saw dung beetles, he got off his horse and cried. He was down on his knees. Uh, University of Texas counted dung beetles all summer long. Um, there they are. And I say dung beetles are starving all over the world. Okay, where did they used to be? Ooh, I'm missing a slide. I think, I, I guess I flipped back. The red area is where dung beetles used to be. They weren't in the taiga, they weren't in the tundra. You know, they used to be in Massachusetts. They have a hard time when you're using antibiotics on your animals, you know, and they have a hard time when you're using in insecticides. So, and this is, uh, this is a ranch, this is their second ranch out near the Pecos River. There's about 15 inches of rain a year in Texas, very, very far down close to Mexico running sheep and cattle in the same place and there's their, they're getting grass. When it rains, they get this kind of grass. You know, 
This was, this was in January, and this was in May. And that's the top composting guy in Texas, Malcolm Beck. Some of you may know that, because we, we have some composting people here. Bat guano was his big thing. So let's go to a second case study. This is in Missouri, and this is land that had been, uh, it couldn't grow corn anymore. It was, it was just wiped out, so they tried to make hay on it. And after about 20 years of hay, um, they had a big problem. So a guy named Greg Judy showed up and thought, what can I do with this land? He had no money. And he thought, a lot of people have land, but they don't know what to do with it. Can I lease land? You know, like a lot of you kids that are in college and thinking, how do I get out on the land and I can't afford? He says, don't ever buy the land, you know, unless you have cash to pay for it. And so that was his approach. And he declared earthworms to be sacred because that was a, you know, a source of uh, all kinds of nutrients. And he wouldn't do anything, like if, if you have, say, two feet of growth, three feet of growth, and you take your herd in there and they, they eat about a third of it, and they trample down about two thirds of it, well that's food for the earthworms, which he considers his, his biggest um, livestock. So, and he was also dung beetles. He doesn't use any antibiotics on his animals. He, he figures out the ones that aren't doing very well and he gets them out of, out of the herd. So, so that's just uh, genetics. And that's his second book, which talks a lot about the soil. And that's $20 for some of the best information you can imagine. Um, there's uh, Abe Collins. I, how'd he get in here? This gives you an idea of the kind of densities that we're talking about. Greg, Greg was talking about uh, much denser herds than Alan Savory ever thought about. Of course, he had a little bit more, more rain, too. But we're finding out that you can do very dense herds if you don't bring them back to an area until the vegetation is ready for it. And this is what uh, Abe's doing in Vermont. And does that grass look, uh, he's using a tumble wheel. So he doesn't even have to move the, the fence, really. He just grabs it on one end and drags it along. And the, the cattle just line right up because they know the best grass is coming. So. <laughs> and Ridge will, talk, Ridge will talk about that. I Get out of here. This first book might be more valuable th to read first because it talks about the economics and how he went about leasing land and, uh, and uh, when he really didn't know what he was doing exactly. So his mistakes are in there. And it would probably help people that want to do this. Now, what's really interesting is NOFA, the, North, the Northeast Organic Farmers Association, got Greg Judy to come give a talk here in uh, Worcester a few weeks ago. And we found out he's working with Mark Shepard to try to make a savanna in Missouri. Now, are we going to let him have a savanna before we make one here in, in New England? Um, so, so I learned about Mark Shepard, and I started saying, does Mark Shepard have any numbers? And uh, he's doing work in Wisconsin. And uh, this is an idea of what the farm looks like. He's doing key line. And then he's trying to, trying to figure out how to capture as much sunlight as possible by having these rows of plants. And we talked to, Jano was talking about similar systems. He's very impressive systems. But they also do grazing, you know. There's, there's 20 feet of space between the rows. Now look at the six, six plant levels that he describes. And chestnuts are right there. What, what did we have in New England? We had chestnuts. So here's, here's some economics. He said the chestnut numbers were probably low. Now you have to start growing the trees, but imagine this as being, being an investment. Instead of trying to grow corn, you know, you make some money grazing on leased land, and then you start growing your chestnuts and you start working towards uh, your $5,000 an acre. Is that enough? Well, you can also raise red currants, asparagus, two cows, four hogs, 10 turkeys, bluebirds, least weasels, and endangered prairie flowers. Isn't this more fun than chemical warfare on the land? And so I wanted to talk about the ocean and the fish and all that. How much time have I got? <laughs> Fish stories. There's a number of these, and a lot of them are happening right here. Seabrook Trout Coalition, 
Michael Hopper's um, up here a lot because they're finding s that brook trout oftentimes go out to sea. After they quit putting the hatchery fish in a lot of these streams, they found wild fish. And they couldn't believe it in some of the streams. But they can also go out to sea and move to other streams if they're ready for them. So if we get our streams flowing continuously, if we have a good wetland plan or, you know, do some of those kind of things, and I think the, the Massachusetts Division of Ecological Restoration is really onto this. They really want to do this. And then, of course, there's the salmon people in Maine that think salmon ought to be all the way to the Connecticut River, which I agree. Uh, new alchemy was mentioned. So a lot of these I'm just going to throw up, up there, and you can ask me about them later. But this was the first, this is a cranberry, near, near a cranberry bog in, on Cape Cod, and one of John Todd's first projects was to clean up a septage lagoon right near the cranberry bog. And he did it with these, you know, these um, translucent tanks. And I did some experiments with this in the chemical industry and found out that organic compounds pretty much break down. We had mass specs looking at, at the water. We had really nasty water going in and breaking it down. This, this pond is actually, you know, cleaned up pretty fast. And that's the, that's the man. And John's still doing work in, uh, near Worcester in Grafton. So, that, so he's still out there. He's older than me, so, so he's getting up there. So if you're a fungi person, it's Paul Stamets. Uh, Stamets says that this is brain tissue in the soil. It's, uh, how, how big does the brain tissue have to be before it's conscious? I think it's very conscious. He thinks that too. This is some of the stuff I made. This is all mycelium. Uh, oyster mushrooms. Uh, Elaine Ingham talks about the soil food web. Uh, read everything she writes. Um, oh, there's shiitakes. Christine Jones is linking the grazers with fungi over in Australia. She's doing amazing work. Um, and there's, there it is. More poop, more perennials, more possibilities, more fungi, more fish, more future. And talking about future, here's, uh, these kids are homeschooled kids. They're 13 to 16 years old. They're working on their AP biology. You know, they're going to take that this year. You know, three years before some of them go to college. And uh, this, is, this is the future to me. And now, can you imagine a rich New England savanna? Could it be biodiverse, have an excellent water cycle, our deep soils being created, many crops and domestic animals, animals on your land, uh, high quality local food, fish and wildlife thrive, and it supports healthy communities and it can make money. So why do you want to grow corn with chemicals? And that's, uh, we'll just leave it at that for now.